1 Peter 4, because, because these people, you're in 2 Peter, go back to 1 Peter 4. Number one, first century believers were facing horrible tortures. And by the way, everybody since the first century has gone through horrible tortures. And so the tribulation is going to be worse than the most horrible tortures anybody's ever gone through. And so everybody has always thought they were at the end. And we also believe that we're in the last days for other reasons, not because we're very much tortured in America. But first century believers faced horrible tortures. Look at verse 12 of 1 Peter 4. Peter said, Beloved, don't think it strange concerning the fire trials, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Now that phrase, fiery trials in verse 12, it could also read, if you, if you read it in the amplified form, where it puts the words, the Greek words in their order and, and emphasizes them the way it does syntactically, it would read like this, the painful trial that burns among you. Now that helps us understand more what's going on. Because where is Peter writing this from? Most commentators would say that Peter, because it says that he wrote from Babylon, either was in Iraq with the Jewish encampment, the, the people that had lived there after the exile, or most likely Babylon is referring, as Revelation does, to Rome, as, as being kind of like Babylon, uh, you know, reformed with all of its mystery religions. But wherever, Peter does end up in Rome. He's killed there. And so sometime in his career, he's through that city, and he knew what Nero was doing. And what Nero was doing was amazing. The followers of Jesus in the city of Rome, most likely where Peter had lived and probably wrote this letter, were being dragged from their families and dipped in tar. Now, when the winter's over and all those potholes were hitting, are filled, and you get behind one of those big public service trucks, you know, where they have the boom on it, and they come over, and they, they have hot tar, and they squirt it in there, and then they shovel, you know, gravel on it, and they tamp it down. Think of a vat of hot tar, and imagine your wife or your daughter or you or your son being dragged out of the house, tied up, dipped in tar up to your shoulders, coated like chocolate, tied to a telephone pole and put into a garden to be burned alive that night at the emperor's banquet. That's what Nero did. In fact, this summer, if you've ever seen the Colosseum and all the pictures of Rome, the Colosseum wasn't around. Nero didn't build the Colosseum. He didn't kill Christians in the Colosseum. It was a Flavian amphitheater. It was 17 years after his death. That was a lake where the Colosseum is now. That was the lake of Nero's palace. And his house was just set up the hill from the lake. And all the way down the hill to the lake where the Colosseum is, he put these Christians on stakes dipped in tar. Now that, look back at verse 12. If you were reading this in the first century and say, yeah, I think it's strange. I don't like fiery trials that are trying us. Peter says, don't think they're strange. Because, and, and keep reading, look at verse 13. Because the second, you know, Peter's describing experiences of pain comparable with the pain of being burned with fire. That's his definition. But look what he says in verse 13. First century believers not only face these horrible tortures, but they experience divine comfort. See, what I want to get to this morning is, how do you have lives like this, that you can be dipped in tar and burned alive and you're still staying with it and not aborting the mission and saying, I'm not a Christian anymore? What made these people so receptive to the Lord? Well, look what he says in verse 13. But rejoice to the extent you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. Our suffering is the same kind of thing that Christ received, and therefore, in a sense, our suffering is an indication of our identification with Christ, is what he's saying. When we suffer for Christ's sake, we're suffering like Christ suffered, and we're identifying with him. But he doesn't stop there. Uh, it's interesting, he says, to the extent that you partake, See that in verse 13? That's, that's the old word we all know, koinonia. That means we're in partnership, we're in fellowship, we're, we're, we're partnering with Christ when we suffer. We share in fellowship with him. But, but look at the end of, of the 13th verse. Peter says, we have this exceeding joy. Now what is he talking about? Well, biblical joy at its deepest sense is rooted in trusting God. It's not attached to circumstances. See, we are so shallow nowadays. We're happy when everything's going well, and we're not happy when everything's not going well. But, uh, and that's human. 
But a believer detaches from their circumstance and has joy. See, that's, that's what he's saying. You have exceeding joy when you're dipped in tar. You have exceeding joy when you're burned alive. You have exceeding joy when it's your wife or mother or sister or daughter or son that had that happen. It's not you're happy. You have joy. And joy is the evidence of the Spirit of God living within us. It's the evidence that the Holy Spirit has moved in because it's unnatural. It's, un, it's, it's not normal to have joy in suffering. And so Peter says, you have exceeding joy because in the deepest sense, it's a profound confidence God is in control of everything in our lives, even the painful places.